Hey, third grade, it's time for the water cycle. This is Rivers of Sl Sunlight. It's by Molly Bang and Penny Chisholm. Now, this is star B-A-N, but actually, I think I may put this under uh, nonfiction sometime, but it's really cool. It's about the water cycle. It's a really pretty book. I love this. Let's do this one. How the Sun Moves Water Around the Earth by Molly Bang and Peggy Chisholm, illustrated by Molly Bang. Rivers of Sunlight. I am your sun. My, oh, my energy warms your days and I light up your world. But of all my planets, only one is teeming with life. Your Earth. Why? Because it is covered with water. H2O. Always moving, always changing from liquid to solid to vapor and back again. Together, water and I give life to your blue planet and to you. Almost all of Earth's water is in your salty seas. To you, the oceans seem very deep, but they're actually just a thin, thin film covering most of your planet. Look, if all of Earth's water were rolled into a ball, and that ball would only be this big compared to the whole Earth. A ball of just Earth's fresh water would only be this big. And most of that is locked away as solid ice or water buried underground. What's this? This tiny dot of water is left of fresh water. And yet this tiny bit is enough to keep all life on land alive. How? because water moves its cycles. And so it is used again and again and again. Drink a glass of water, feel it flow into your body. Most of your body is made of water. Water carries food and oxygen to every cell and helps keep your temperature just right. The water you drink stays inside you for a few days and then travels on flushing your wastes away. Just as water flows and cycles inside you, it flows and cycles around your earth, keeping all life alive. Where did your water come from? Where is it going? What keeps it moving? I do. Your son. I lift water from the salty sea by warming the ocean's surface waters and see how my, the, my heat makes the H2O molecules jiggle, jiggle, jiggle until they pop into the air, leaving their salt behind. That's evaporation. Liquid water becomes a gas, water vapor. The molecules of pure, fresh water vapor float up, up, up. Spread out. They join the cocoon of water vapor that envelops your whole earth. This cocoon catches some of my light energy and helps keep Earth's temperature just right for life. Some of the water vapor rises even higher to the cooler layers of the atmosphere. When a molecule of water vapor catches a speck of dust, suddenly a million more grab hold to form one drop. And water vapor becomes liquid again and drops collect in clouds and they grow larger and heavier and they pour out of the sky as rain or snow and then fall back into the sea. But some of the water vapor above the sea joins a river of water vapor flying through the sky. My winds blow the river, this river across the sky toward land. Now rain and snow fall on land. Snow piles up on mountaintops each winter, and in the warmth of spring it melts and flows with fallen rains to streams and rivers and lakes. See how some of the water vapor seeps deep down into the sand and the gravel. They hold the water like a giant sponge lying on a floor of solid rock. These underground waterlogged sponges are aquifers. Aquifers are saving, savings banks of fresh water storing deep, still water for thousands of years. Above them, I keep water moving and flowing. I shine my light on lakes and rivers and soggy soil. And again, water evaporates into the air. I shine my light on trees and plants. They draw up water from the ground and use my light to photosynthesize, building more plants, which feed all living things on Earth. 
As they photosynthesize, the plants pump water vapor into the air, and it rises up to join the giant river in the sky. My winds push the flying rivers so rain and snow can fall on mountains and prairies and forests and deserts, nourishing plants there. And so water cycles around and around, over and over and over again. What would happen if I did not move water? There would be no rain, no rivers, no life on your blue planet. If I did not move water, and I move a lot of water, every year I evaporate a hundred quadrillion gallons of fresh water from the seas. Each year my winds blow one-tenth of that fresh water, ten quadrillion gallons over to the land, and the rest falls back into the sea. If I keep moving fresh water from the seas to land, why don't the seas get hot, saltier, and saltier? And why don't they eventually dry up? Because each year, the rivers of the world deliver 10 quadrillion gallons of fresh water back to the seas, replacing what was lost. I keep water moving and recycling from sea to air to land and back again. I keep the cycle in balance. And I also cycle water in the sea. Yes, I move a giant river inside the seas. Just as water circulates in you to feed you and flush your wastes and regulate your temperature, the ocean river does the same thing throughout the seas. How? My light heats your Earth's equator steadily all year long, so the surface water there stays very warm. My winds help move a wide current of that warm water west until the current bounces against land, the Americas, and curls back into swirling eddies. See how the warm current cha changes north and then bends towards Europe? This is the Gulf Stream, part of the enormous ocean river. And as the Gulf Stream flows, heat rises from its water, warming the air above. My winds blow that warm air overland where it heats the land itself. If the Gulf Stream didn't flow, winters in Europe would be much colder. And as it lets go of its heat, the Gulf Stream's water cools. And in the far north, some of it freezes into solid ice, squeezing its salt out into the sea. Lighter than water, ice floats. See it hanging in the frigid, super salty sea? Salty water is heavier than fresh water. Cold water is heavier than warm water. Cold water ho holds more oxygen than warm water. So the cold, salty, heavy, oxygen-rich Arctic waters plunge down and become a giant waterfall inside the sea. Two miles deep, it plummets, driving the giant river along the ocean floor. This is a massive artery of water that is the great ocean conveyor belt. The conveyor belt snakes through the deep, dark ocean, delivering oxygen to the sea, deep sea creatures and gathering nutrients that float down from above. Near Antarctica, the current splits in two. Eventually, both currents rise up to the sunlit water surface, bringing the nutrients and to the proto phytoplankton that feed all of ocean life. My heat warms the currents, falling rain dilutes their salty water. Turning, flowing west, the currents join and merge at last with the Gulf Stream to begin the cycle once again. Driven by changes in salt and temperature, driven by me, your son, the great conveyor belt keeps the oceans alive and regulates Earth's temperature. Yes, my sunlight energy keeps water moving around, in the planet, in the seas, in the sky, in the land, bringing your world to life. Moving water also changes Earth's landscape. Drop by drop, water can eat into hard rock. Over eons, it carves deep canyons in the land. As it flows over rocks, water pulls out essential minerals, nutrients, delivering them to all living things, including you. Water seeps into cracks and freezes, breaking boulders into bits, carrying the rubble down, down, down to the plains. Huge glaci glaciers, rivers of frozen water. 
gouge deep valleys out of towering mountains. Water is soft and yielding, but it is very, very powerful. For billions of years, I, your son, have cycled water around Earth as your ancestors made homes near lakes and rivers so they would have enough water. They built great civilizations by inventing waterworks, digging wells, and constructing dams and canals and aqueducts to control the flow of water. As their populations grew, the water could feed larger and larger crops and bigger herds of animals. The total amount of the water on your Earth will always be the same. But now, more than 7 billion people live on Earth, pouring wastes into rivers, lakes, and coastal waters, using and moving too much water. Some rivers are running dry. Some aquifers are being drained faster than rain can replenish them. The water balance around the world is changing. More and more places have too little water. Drought dries up the crops. More places have too much. Floods sweep over the land. As your earth warms, the balance will shift even more. Sea levels will rise, swamping coastal cities. This I promise. I, your son, will do my part to keep earth's water clean and flowing. Will you do you, your part? Will you find ways to use water sparingly and keep it clean? Remember, you share Earth's water with everything alive, and your life depends on the whole web of life. And at the end of the book, I'm going to read some more of this too. Excuse me, I, I got to clear my throat. <coughs> water is life. We live on a very special planet. Other planets have ice or water vapor, and seem, some even appear to have oceans below their surface. But only Earth is covered with the vast expanses of liquid water, along with your, our Goldilocks distance from the sun, not too hot, not too cold. This liquid water is what makes life as we know it possible. It's not just the presence of water that gives Earth life. It's the fact that it is constantly moving evaporating from the salty sea into fresh water, moving through the sky toward land, falling as rain or snow, seeping into groundwater, gathering into rivers, and finally, finally, flowing back into the sea. This global hydrological cycle is the focus of our story. Water, water everywhere. The total amount of water on our planet, about 332 billion cubic miles of water, has st stayed the same for millions of years. Now, what? that sounds like a lot. If Earth, Earth were the size of an ap apple and all that water was spread over its surface, it would form a film thinner than the apple skin. Almost 98% of Earth's water is salt water in the ocean. And much of what's left, <coughs> see me, Earth's fresh water is locked up in the ice caps of glaciers or groundwater. So, only a tiny, that tiny fraction of Earth's total water supply is readily available to life on Earth. These numbers tell us how much water exists in different places, but not how fast it moves from place to place. This is the key to understanding water supply. Imagine yourself at the as the average water molecule moving through the global cycle. You will spend thousands of years in the ocean before you evaporate and then ride with the wind for a few days before falling as rain or snow. If you fall into a lake, you will spend a few decades there. If into a river or onto soil, you will stay there a few months. And if perchance a living creature swallows you, you will occupy its body for a few days before you move on. But if you seep into an aquifer, you could stay there for thousands of years. And if you end up frozen in Antarctica, you could stay there for hundreds of thousands of years. These time frames are called residence times, and they reflect how long it takes to completely replace the water in a particular place with new water. Think of a deep aquifer full of contaminants. If the residence time there is short, the aquifer can be flushed clean quickly, but it, if it is long, the contaminants would stay there for a very long time. Water is an extraordinary molecule. Water molecules are made of two hydrogen atoms attached to one oxygen atom in the middle, H2O. 
Because of its special molecular structure, water is the only molecule known to exist as a solid, ice, a liquid, water, and a gas, vapor, or steam at everyday pressures and temperatures. Individual water molecules can loosely attach to one another in many different ways. This enables water to hold a lot of heat before its temperature increases, roughly 10 times more than rocks, for example. This is why surface, surface ocean currents can grab the sun's heat at the equator and carry it northward without increasing in temperature so much as to kill all of its inhabitants. Because of these special properties this, that water has, its ability to morph from liquid to solid to gas, and its heat capacity, water can move around the earth carrying the sun's heat with it. Why don't lakes freeze to the bottom? Why does ice float? It's because of an, another bizarre feature of water. Like other liquids, water increases in density, weight, per unit volume as it cools. So, in autumn, as surface lake waters cool, they sink to the bottom and fill the whole lake with cool, dense water. However, as winter approaches and the surface water begins to freeze, that icy water starts to get lighter. Why? Because near the freezing point, the attachments between water molecules switch from a random to a regular pattern, a rigid structure that has fewer molecules per unit volume, is less dense. It's not as thick than liquid water. <coughs> so ice floats above the slightly warmer, denser water below. And then water evaporates from any liquid surface or from you when you sweat. It changes from a liquid, liquid to water vapor, which is invisible. In the process, it takes some heat with it, cooling the surface as it leaves in what is called evaporative cooling. As warm water vapor rises in the atmosphere, it cools and eventually condenses as water droplets that form clouds and rain. The evaporation of water near the surface is followed by its recondensation high in the atmosphere, and it plays an important part in water's life. Okay, I'm going to stop right now because I am about to run out of my battery, but this is a lovely book and I hope you guys get to read it when you come to the library sometime.